<clears throat> Salaamu Alaikum folks. Um, <clears throat> hopefully uh, this time uh, we won't be as inept. Uh, I won't be as inept as I was yesterday. I got myself into a real funk. Um, uh, we're pursuing our, our exploration of the eight stations of attention. And as I indicated, every uh, with every iteration, we'll also kind of examine, you know, any questions people may have. So there were two questions that came up after our conversation yesterday. Um, uh, and uh, they're, they're actually very related. So I'd like to, um, I'm going to put them both up. The one is from Shafahar, who said, is the pre is presence the link between intention and attention? And then Aisha, um, is intent the nature or character of one's gaze and attention, the gaze itself? Um, so, so, so clearly, uh, we are kind of struggling to come to terms with the distinction between these two phenomena, the issue of intention and the issue of attention. And so, so, so here's my view of the matter. I mean, I think that the, the problem is we're trying to put forward um, a, a language and, if you like, a nomenclature to help explore one's inner life, one's inner experience. So um, I suppose one could have also added to the mix words like consciousness or awareness or all kind of I, uh, words that are concerned with your inner experience, what's happening behind your eyes. Now, um, I think the problem is that the reality of what's, one, what's behind one's eyes is so vast and in, is so fundamentally formless. I mean, it certainly doesn't have the shape of your, your head. It, your inner experience is not head-shaped. Uh, if you just allow your, your attention to drift back behind your eyes a bit, you'll feel that this, this doesn't correspond, it doesn't even correspond to a body image. This, this thing that you are looking out of, this thing that you could call your awareness or your consciousness or your attention or indeed your intention. The, 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 this, this, this is a huge and vast territory. So um, um, that's why I suppose uh, we're, we're taught um, man, man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu. Um, in other words, to know yourself and you know your Lord. And if you say, well, who is the Lord and what is the Lord, then clearly he is that which is beyond measure, um, majestic beyond expectation and description and vast beyond belief. So he's just always the superlative, always the beyond. And that's actually the character of what sits behind your eyes. Of what, so, so, so can you see that any word that we use, to sort of hold that thing is going to be an, an, an adequate word. So I don't think there actually is such a thing as intention or attention. Just as I think, don't think there's such a thing as consciousness, and I don't think there's such a thing as awareness. Not because they're, they're, these things don't exist, but the, the problem is that the words as vessels are far too small to describe the reality that they're pointing at. It is like trying to hold an ocean in a thimble. You, the, 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 word will, the words will always be inadequate. So what am I trying to say here is that both intention and attention are descriptive frameworks to try and get some compass and some handle of this peculiar vast reality that sits behind one's eyes and how that reality operates. And as I indicated to you yesterday, I actually think the two words refer to the same thing. But you, that it is like, you know, it is like looking at the same phenomenon through a different set of lenses. So we're looking at this thing of this wakefulness that sits behind your eyes. 
it really is very constructive to look at that 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 object experience doing that that reality that sits behind your eyes through the lens of intent because when you look at it through the lens of intent a number of things become really obvious and it's principally around this issue of the distinction between inward gatheredness and outward gatheredness and this whole idea of um of either being dominated by the world and being the victim or actually having a sense of autonomy and also how that relates to the maturation journey so it's very helpful to describe the patterning, the functioning of this reality behind your eyes when you look at that reality through the issue of intention. Equally, it's also useful to take that away and to look at it through a different lens, and we call that lens attention. Then um, other things come to light, uh, and particularly things come to light in terms of our our ongoing experience of the world whether we find the world experience the world as either being um, threatening and dominating or we experience the world to be a benefactor and an ally um, so 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 i think intention and attention are looking at the same things through different portals so so it's not so please don't get me wrong i don't think these are different phenomena you see both of these questions shafakhir's question and unless i misunderstood the questions that's entirely possible but i think shafakhir's question and aisha's question are still trying to distinguish between the two phenomena and whereas i don't think there is a distinction i think it's one phenomenon that we're looking at with different toolage different compasses Um, <clears throat> so, um, I'm not going to go through the whole model of attention as I did yesterday, but I'm just going to remind you a few insights that we had around the station of the insignificant. You remember we said the station of the insignificant was the station of the infant, of the newborn infant. The newborn infant who has a very little capacity to dis to actually apprehend or, or distinguish significance because in a sense they're looking at soup their 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 their, their perception is is yet untrained they come into the world playing this conservative drum of the inward very very loudly um, uh, where most of the attention is actually trapped behind the eyes in the inner experience in sleep because the infant sleeps more than what they're awake in the beginning um, as time goes on, as they move through the station, more and more of their attention is gathered outward. They start getting a greater and greater interest in the world. They start recognizing more and more. So as this, um, this conservative drum of the inward is played less and the progressive drum as the outward is played more, eventually this creates an imbalance. Um, you remember we said imbalance is always an, is simultaneously, by definition, an attraction towards and a move away from. So if a pole is falling, it's simultaneously a move towards and a move away from something, if it is imbalanced. So this station of the insignificance has an imbalance built into its character. The imbalance is a move towards the outward and a move away from the inward. So as we progress, as the infant progresses through this phase of, of their maturation, their attention gets more and more outwardly gathered. They get more and more interested in the world. They spend less and less time asleep. And the oscillations between wakefulness and sleep get longer and longer. So more and more waking time is experienced. More and more attention is in the world. So what's happening is the person's attention is beginning to get is being going from the sort of sleep which is deep behind the window of perception it is now coming into the window it's beginning to look at the window of perception you remember we described the window of perception as that which is um, encapsulated by the circle at the periphery of your um, uh, your your um, your your vision so at the, 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 right, at the end of your peripheral vision, at the very limit of it, there's this boundary. We call that boundary your window of perception. 
Now you might say, but I mean, that doesn't work uh, uh, for other senses. I mean, maybe it, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for how I, my tactile experience or my audio experience. Actually, it does work. The same idea. You're always on this side of an experience. And the experience is always, in a sense, presented in front of you. So, so this window of perception kind of idea holds. We experience the stuff over there in front of us. So as the infant kind of moves into the world, as, you know, you know, within weeks after being born, more and more attention is, is, is more and more curiosity is directed to the outward. It's kind of the attention is kind of coming closer and closer to the window of perception. Eventually, this progressive drum of the outward is played so hard that, that the imbalance becomes insustainable and the station flips into the next station of attention. And we call the next station of attention the station of form. So the apex of the station of form is not, bear in mind, this is not the infant designating form in the world. This is the infant gaining form, getting form. The, so this is the state of the crawler. Um, you know, <clears throat> so I'd like you to bear in mind that this window of perception is actually quite an intriguing place because there's, it's like a, on the, for most, it's, if you, there's the window of perception. And then suddenly when I get down to the bottom here, there's pieces that are presented in the window of perception that are intimately connected to the inward. In other words, there are things, there's the outward, and then there's the inward, and then there's a certain encrustation on the shoreline, which is actually my own body, which is both inward and outward. And the way to understand this is put your hand next to the hand of somebody else. So, and, and to make it really creepy, put your, the, your right hand flat down next to the right hand of another person. And first of all, examine the similarities. And you see these things are intriguingly similar. They both have thumbs. They both have index fingers. They both have middle fingers, ring fingers, and little fingers. They both have the very similar shape. But what's really creepy about the one is that you can't do this with that one. Isn't that amazing? I mean, these two things look exactly the same, but you can't do this with the one that isn't yours. So there's some phenomena in the world that are actually look like other phenomena in the world that are somehow connected to volition. They're somehow connected to your inwardness. This is your form. Your form is, is the parts of you that present on the shoreline of your window of perception, which is actually the, the interspace between the inward and the outward. Now, what's very important about that form is you have to learn it. You see, so, so, so the, the, the station of maturity of the person who's in this station of attention is the station of maturity of the crawler. Um, now, you might have noticed a number of things about crawlers, your kids. First of all, the most interesting thing to a crawler is a grocery cupboard. Um, there are two really interesting things in a kitchen for a crawler. The one is the grocery cupboard, and the second is a pots and pan cupboard. Now, why the grocery cupboard is so intriguing is because a grocery cupboard in, contains one of these, this amazing thing called flour. And the only usefulness of a flower, parents have forgotten this. In fact, they don't understand this at all because they're quite stupid. But actually, the, the crawler knows the only useful thing about flour is that you can rip the bag open and pour it over yourself. And the point of doing that is to have this extraordinary experience that that which was previously kind of brown is now suddenly gone snow white. And, and, and that surprise that this thing, that the change, changes of experience in this gives me a sense of this. So in other words, the, the, when the crawler is pouring the flower over its head, it's actually not exploring its world. It's exploring the child is exploring his or herself. She's exploring herself. She's exploring her own shape. The change of color of her hand gives her a sense of her shape. When she invades the, um, the pots and pan cupboard, I mean, what also the thing that very stu stupid adults really have forgotten is that the, 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 
the real usefulness of a pan is that you can pick the thing up and smack it really hard on the floor. And when you do that, it makes an unbelievable noise, which is very entertaining, of course. But, but actually, what I'm doing when I'm smacking the pan on the floor is I'm not actually trying to understand or explore the sound a pan makes when I hit it on the floor. I'm actually exploring what my own hand can do. So this initial exploration, this curiosity that attention exhibits in the state, in the crawler is the crawler gaining form. It's the crawler understanding that there's actually bits of me that present themselves as objects of the world, which are intimately connected to the inside, to the subject. This part of the scene is intimately connected to the seer. That is my form. And that is an explored reality. It's something I've got to learn about. It's not immediately obvious in the experience. Now, like all of these stations, they open between two extremes. And the station of, the of form of the crawler is pinned between the extreme of gatheredness, the binary opposite of gatheredness, and the binary opposite of separation. And bear in mind, that gatheredness, we also indicated it's the, it's the sort of, it's the state of the infant. It's the state of, of, of not just the place where attention gets gathered to, but also the gatheredness on mother's knee, the, the being wrapped up. Whereas separation is also about alienation. It's about that which is vast and out there. Now, from about... I mean, I should know this because I, I've, I've, just, I've had two grandchildren recently. So, I mean, grandchildren are the most fascinating experiments. You know, I, I, I pray that you all have the experience. But um, uh, 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 principally because you can get your own back on your children. But that's a, that's, that's a discourse for another day. But, um, so, so, at the beginning of this experience of form, the infant, ha the, the, the infant cannot bear to lose sight of the mother. So from about eight months or nine months old, you'll notice this. Infants go through a period of getting really panic struck when the mother leaves the room. So it's this sense of sort of suddenly recognizing that, that separation from mother is possible and, and alienation from mother is possible. And this is a really, really, really unpleasant experience. So at the beginning of the station of form, there's a real desire to stay close to mother, to stay gathered on mother's knee. So that is the conservative drum of the station. As the crawler progresses through the station of form, it starts to play this progressive drum of separation more and more. So um, I had a fascinating experience uh, about, must be about two years ago. Yes, because it was when my granddaughter Sophia was just entering this stage of her kind of development. I, I went to Pakistan I, with uh, my son Assad and my daughter-in-law Miriam. So, so it was the four of us that traveled, uh, my, uh, me, uh, Sophia's parents and Sophia. And I was very clever, you know, as I said, grand grandparents are not as stupid as we look. I made sure I wasn't sitting in the same row as them because I wasn't going to get involved in the, in the drama that was going to unfold. And besides, I wanted to be a spectator, not a participant. And so um, uh, the, 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 the beginning of this flight was fascinating because uh, Miriam was having an ongoing wrestling match with Sophia. And I could see Miriam was on the absolute edge of her tether because this child was incontainable. She was literally fighting her mother off, trying to get off the seat. She didn't want to be confined to the seat. She wanted to go. She wanted to explore the plane. She couldn't because the plane was about to take off. So, so there was this fight going on and forcing the child into the seat and putting the, and the child howling in discontent. And that was fantastic to watch, really entertaining. Anyhow, once this plane had taken off, um, the, um, uh, Miriam then, uh, with some kind of relief, uh, let, uh, let Sophia out of the chair and Sophia was, was, was down the aisle of this aircraft, 
like a bullet out of a gun. I mean, absolutely like a shot. She couldn't be gone fast enough. So she was actually trying to, so she was fighting to get off mother's knee. She was fighting the gatheredness. She wanted to pull away. She wanted to separate. And she, she went quite away, probably about, I don't know, probably about 15, 20 meters down this aisle. And then some ugly old man, it wasn't me, some ugly old man further down sort of looked at her and growled at her and she got a fright and she went scampering back to her mother. And that was the story of the flight. She'd sit on her mother's knee for a moment, get bored, get off, go. And, but what was interesting is that every iteration, she went further and further and further. And that really demonstrates what's happening in the station of four. We are, we are, we are pulling further and further away from gatheredness. Think of it as an elastic band. You're kind of, you're, you're stretching it, stretching it. You're playing this, this progressive drum of separation louder and louder and louder until finally, at some point, it snaps. That same sense of imbalance takes place. Your exploration into the outward world, pulling, pushing further and further, eventually gets you to the point where, whoops, you've flipped into the new station of attention, the station of the outward. This is where... This, this is, oh, let me stop myself because um, I'm on a roll. But this is the attention of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the child in middle childhood. So this is, um, yeah, let's say no more, folks. We'll, we'll explore that tomorrow. Um, so let's have a look if there are any questions here. Bismillah. Uh, right, folks. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Um, so, um, from Ulam Kafil Saab in Lahore, uh, are there some other lenses in addition to intent and attention? Yes, I think there are. Um, I think consciousness is one, I think awareness is another. Um, uh, so, so uh, and, and there may be more. Uh, there more than likely is because understand we're dealing with a reality that's so vast that um, you can use all sorts of language to explore it. So um, um, uh, there are there are more. The two that I've gained a little bit of proficiency in is in these two, and it's these two that I work with when I'm trying to be helpful to people. So if I could just, I mean, I know this is not addressing your question, um, uh, feel sad, but. Uh, so, so just why is it useful to have compasses like this? Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, the, um, it's useful to have a compass because it's useful to understand where you are in your own journey. Secondly, it's useful to have a compass particularly in the latter stages of your journey, because actually remember that you're dealing with a reality that's as vast as Allah, the reality inside your, behind your eyes, the reality on this side of the window of perception is as vast as Allah, because it is Allah in essence. So it's very useful to have some kind of compass because otherwise you, you do, you can end up, becoming completely dysfunctional, which is not necessarily a catastrophe for the person who's dysfunctional, but it's a catastrophe for everybody else, which is one of the reasons why we Sufis have a very bad reputation. So that's why I think it's useful to have some toolage to navigate the, your inner space. Um, from Zahida, um, awareness and focus on something, Sheikh, uh, please discuss. Awareness and focus. So, I do think that um, uh, uh, focus as a word is not, so, so you remember we said that there are other frameworks that you can use to explore your inner space. You can use, other than intention and attention, you can talk about awareness, you can talk about consciousness. Uh, focus, however, is not a good word. And the reason why focus is not a good word is that it really only describes one out of two broad possibilities of the functioning of attention. 
focus. So f- first of all, focus is obviously visual. You know, when you're looking at something, you're focusing on something. So focusing is a, is a visual um, uh, idiom. Now, I'd like you to consider, and I, you, we may have said this before, but I'd like you to consider the distinction between the two statements. He's looking at me and he's listening to me. Do those things feel different? And if you consider it, you will say, yeah, well, they do feel very different. I feel somewhat threatened when he's looking at me. I feel judged when he's looking at me. I feel he's trying to kind of bore into me. Whereas I feel far more pleasant. I feel accepted when he's listening to me. So there's these two modalities of attention. We call the first modality, which is consistent with eyesight, because we've got predator's eyes. We've got eyes like lion's. Um, that first modality we call predatory attention. The second modality we call receptive attention. And it's like the attention that somebody who's a really good listener can use. But in a sense, they're not competing for space. They're not trying to push into the world and appear. They're actually making space. They're allowing you appear, to appear. They're listening to you. The word focus exclusively refers to predatory attention, precisely because it is visual in character and is concerned with picking out the one thing among many. You see, receptive attention, one of the characteristics is it can hold a number of things in attention at the same time, whereas focus cannot. So focus is not a good framing to explore your inner world because it only gives you the verbiage and the toolage to deal with half of it. And it's not the actually, the actually, actually not the best half of it. Uh, from Ali. Would referring to the movement of the triangle as a rotation instead of a flip help? Yes, I'm sure you could do it like that because it is. So, 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 so you know, all growth is incremental, but you know, some increments have experienced as big changes. So, so, I mean, think about it in your own life. There was a definite point in your life where you were no longer a child, you were an adolescent. And you probably got there like boiled frog. You, you, you know how you, you know the boiled frog theory. You throw a, a frog into boiling water, it'll leap out. But if you leave a frog in uh, in, in tepid water or, 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 or the water it's comfortable with, and slowly increase the temperature, it doesn't notice the change and it boils to death. So so um, there's our changes of station are like that. We, we there's this incremental increase in pressure this this progressive drum gets played louder and louder but at some point the frog is dead i mean there's been a fundamental change that's what i mean by by flip that's what i mean by i mean it might have been actually a small slip but that slip has actually eventually introduced you to a new epoch of attention a new epoch in, of how you 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 operate and you different things will be challenges to you then like as we've already indicated um, the, what's happening with an infant is somewhat different from what's happening to the, the crawler because the infant is still sort of trying to, it's still trying to understand what's in the window of perception. It's sort of coming into the window. The crawler is actually trying to appear. It's, try, it's putting bits of itself into the window. So these are different stages. Right, a child may transition to form, from form to outward sooner, while others might take much longer. Nestled in gatheredness, why is this so? So, Mahanla <laughs> Zuhayb. Yes. And why? I don't know. But you know, there is. Um, I do want to say that that uh, I mean, parenting obviously has something to do with it, and it is true that you can spoil your children. But I think far more distressing than spoiling children is that, that children, in a sense, very often need to grow up, end up growing up faster than, than, than would be reasonable or comfortable. And it's because they get traumatized at too early an age. So there's an Afrikaans idiom that says, vroeg rijp, vroeg vrot. That means early ripe, early rotten. You know, um, you, you can see uh, a, a child 
in a sense, gets gets fast tracked into uh, like a crawler could get fast tracked into the sense of form by being brutalized, by being beaten, by literally becoming aware of its form because of immense pain being done to it. But the problem is then it gets arrested in that station. So, so um, I I um, I think parenting has a lot to do with it. But then I think it's also just the nature of the child. I mean, you get three or four children who grow up to the same parents. And they 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 matured completely different rates. I don't think. I don't think the early maturation, and and how long one tarries in these early, early stages, is particularly interesting or useful. I think it's the latter end that's important, to, and we'll get there obviously in the, in some further iterations. But you know, in a sense, one can. I think, you know, within reason, you can indulge the child. I mean, you can allow the child to wallow a little bit. Uh, I mean, the brutality of the world will get it to wake up at some point anyhow. So Aisha, is attachment therefore inherently restrictive to one's attention evolving? Look, this is, Aisha, your question is related to Zuhaib's question. Some of us just like to kind of bask in stages longer than others. So I don't think one should be prescriptive about this. Um, like, like, you know, um, listen, it's now, it's now three months and, and five days. In, uh, now I'm going to put you down. You must suffer now. I mean, that's, um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, yeah. I think some of us just tarry longer. And, and if, you're, if you have a, you're blessed if you have a parent who's patient enough to allow you to tarry longer. I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it as a parent, though, unless it's I mean, obviously clearly dysfunctional. Yes, Zahida, the, 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 the transition that I spoke about pertaining to the, 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 actually the similar transition that happened at every point. Um, of, but we will get to the teens later. The teens, um, just a little bit of a heads up, the teens is the station of separation. It's the most alienated state. Um, I think you can prepare yourself for that one. You bring a box of tissues, you'll be in tears. It's going to be very sad. Uh, 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 the transition examples are more related to phys the physical world, related to the five senses. Are there some other examples related to the spiritual world, like how we can understand gatheredness and separation at that level? I'll have to think about that, what I'm feeling. Um, because you, you, you are, I, I think the question, so my, my first to, uh, kind of response to the question is dodging it. And I'm dodging it because I suspect that actually, so, so the, 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 bear in mind, the attention is about our engagement with here, with place. And here has these two manifestations. It has the outward and the inward. The outward and the inward correspond with the distinction between the hidden and the manifest and the um, the the uh, the seen and the unseen. So when you speak about the spiritual, you're speaking about the unseen. This is this is something on the inside. These are realities we only start coming to grips with later on. The child is actually fleeing that. I don't know if you've had a child who's, who's had night terrors. All th all three of my sons had night terrors. And it's the most horrifying thing to watch. And I think I actually had it myself as a kid. And it's like this, this reality behind your eyes is so scary that, in fact, they, 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 certain times, particularly in sleep, it gets so terrifying, they, they, they'll do anything to escape it. You know, they, it's, it's just too spooky. It's just too hocus pocus, too ooga booga. They, they do anything out there rather than this scariness in the inside. So, so I, I think actually the first part of our journey is about the material. It is about learning to engage this world. You know, the concreteness, the sort of my hands, my, my, my five senses. 
All right, folks, thank you very much. I think that we've done well for today. Um, thank you for your participation. And um, may Allah bless you all and keep you all safe and grant that this period is being as immense a blessing for you as what it's proving to be for me. Um, uh, fear man, all the best. Assalamu alaikum.